and I shall try and share my uh, my screen then. Ah, well, let me. Okay, I'll say a word. I'll say a word to introduce you. Sure. Uh, 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 Gert is um, everyone. I think here knows that he's been a moving force, almost the moving force behind uh, ASIPTA, which has really brought together people uh, from. Um, uh, all kinds of people interested in foundations of probability and uh, probabilistic reasoning. Uh, but his own uh, research uh, accomplishments are very substantial. Uh, really, he's been uh, the leader in imprecise probabilities. I think that's fair to say for uh, more than 20 years. Uh, I, uh, um, and so it's a pleasure that he's been able, that if we finally have them in our foundations of probability seminar, uh, so I will, uh, I don't know how long, I was going to say how long I have known you, Gerd, and I, I can't, I can't remember, <laughs> but again, uh, oh. at least, uh, you know, 20, 30, 30 years at least. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it, leave it to, uh, Gert. welcome. Thank you, Glenn. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen, share the presentation, but it, it appears that the, the host has disabled my uh, screen sharing, so I can't do that. If uh, somebody could enable this. Sorry, can you try it again? Yeah, I'll try it now. Okay, here we go. Okay, great. So can you see it? Yes. Can you see my, yes? Yes. I see my slides. So, so, um, yeah, just to start, welcome everybody to this uh, to this talk. It's a talk about randomness and imprecision. Um, it's a talk where um, what we try to do is introduce imprecision, interval forecasting into the notion of randomness. And it's a joint work that's been going on for quite a while between um, Jasper, who was a former PhD student of mine and is now associate professor at Ghent University in my group, and, and myself. It's been a very, very close collaboration and it's been quite fruitful and a lot of fun. There's a number of other people we've had discussions with and have learned from. And I think the initial idea for this work started in, um, started from or originated in a conversation that I had with Philip David um, when, uh, when he wondered what, what imprecise forecasting would be, would be like. And um, then as we went along, um, the paper on which this talk uh, was based uh, was read several times by, by Volodya. Uh, and he commented on, on successive versions of the paper and always has had uh, interesting insights uh, that he shared with us. And uh, so he has been a wonderful source of, uh, of inspiration to us. And then Floris, uh, whom, you're, whom you've already met, um, he is, um, He's uh, just recently started working on this, and a number of things that, uh, that I'll talk about here have been inspired by uh, conversations with him. Also, of course, and this is uh, something I have to mention, is that, that this talk will give the beginning of an answer to questions that were raised by Terry Fine, who uh, sadly uh, passed away on January 31st uh, of this, this year. And I'd like to, um, to acknowledge an intellectual debt that I have to Terry and also uh, a debt of, um, I think of, of kindness and of, of, uh, of, of uh, an interest that he, uh, that he showed in my work that, uh, that meant a lot to me when I was a younger researcher. And so um, this is why I'd like to, um, to really uh, remember him today. Um, so let's get started with the real things. Um, we're going to talk about sequences of zeros and ones, infinite sequences of zeros and ones. So you, you see the beginning of such a sequence here on the slide. Um, and we're going to ask ourselves the question, when is such a zero, sequence of zero and ones random? Uh, when could it be, for instance, produced by a mechanism that we consider to be uh, random? Um, there's a few things that I want to get out of the way before we, uh, we get to the real mathematics and the real stuff. And that is that um, there is, of course, a very close connection between such sequences of um, 
zeros and ones and, and real numbers, of course, if I put a zero and a decimal point in, uh, in front of the sequence, what I get is the binary expansion of a real number between uh, zero and one, so in, in the unit interval. And so there is this correspondence between such sequences and real numbers that we will come across a number of times in this talk and that I want to, uh, to mention here just to make sure that everyone uh, understands when, understands it when I get there. Um, another thing that I want to, uh, to make clear from the beginning is that there is, in fact, a very close um, connection between randomness and, and forecasting, between randomness and calibration. Um, so if I have a sequence of zeros and ones, um, uh, and you see the beginning, as I said, of such a sequence here, what we could do is we could imagine that these are um, zeros and ones that are produced by coin flipping, for instance. So where heads, for instance, gives us a zero and tails gives us a one. And when that is the case, then we could put in front of each of these outcomes, which are in, in black here, we could put... Uh, uh, a forecast, uh, a probability for the next outcome to be one, we could put that uh, in front of this, um, this outcome. And so we get a sequence, a mixed sequence of forecasts immediately brought, followed by the uh, outcome for which the forecast was given. And randomness in this case will be uh, in, in an expression of a relationship between the forecasts on the one hand and the sequences of outcomes, so the outcomes on the other hand. It will mean that these forecasts are in some way um, closely connected to the outcomes in the sequence. That is um, the first observation that I want to make. Of course, we can extend this. When we go from coin flipping to prediction of another uh, of other phenomena that can produce two kinds of outcomes, for instance, if I want to predict um, whether it's going to rain tomorrow, and so rain tomorrow means a one, and uh, and and uh, no rain means a zero, then I can have a forecaster who emits a probability of rain tomorrow every time before tomorrow happens, right? And so we get a sequence of uh, forecasts followed by outcomes. And again, in this case, we have um, a sequence of probabilities or a sequence of forecasts, and then a sequence of uh, zeros and ones that follow these forecasts. And randomness in this case will mean, randomness of the sequence of zeros and ones will mean that the forecasts are well calibrated, that forecasts and sequences go, um, go together well. What we're going to do here is we're going to extend uh, these, these precise forecasts in the previous slide. So in this slide, what we're going to do is we have these, these real numbers in the unit interval that precede each outcome, these forecasts, and we're going to replace them by intervals, by uh, intervals, sub-intervals, closed sub-intervals of the unit interval. So intervals between zero and one. And we're going to give meaning to those interval forecasts. And we're also going to express that such forecasts and such sequences go together well. So in what I wanted to say is that randomness is about calibration. Randomness is about an income sequence and an outcome sequence going together well. Uh, so it's a relationship between outcome sequences and forecast sequences. And because this is a relationship between two things, it has two ways of looking at it in a way. So we can start with a given forecast sequence and ask ourselves, what are the outcome sequences that are random for this given forecast sequences? That's one way of looking at the phenomenon. Another way is we can start with an outcome sequence and ask ourselves, what are the forecast sequences that make this um, outcome sequence random? Yeah. And so it is this second way of looking, which we thought was, and which we think is, is very, very interesting, and which hasn't, in fact, been uh, of much interest to the research uh, community. Um, in fact, well, it, it, it's the case that when you look at, at precise forecasts, this is not a very, not always a very useful question. But when you look at imprecise forecasts, this becomes quite useful, as we will see. Uh, further on, so this other way of looking at it. I think the only people, the only uh, person I'm aware of who looked into this problem in the precise case is, is Volodya again. 
right? So he um, he looked at this problem also in the in the precise case. Okay, so let's go on. There is this uh, idea that randomness and calibration outcome sequences and full pass sequences going together well. That this is going to be important for uh, for randomness. So. We still have to explain what it means or say what it means to go together well. So the intuitive idea is that each forecast in the sequence will represent some, and now I, I get to, um, to the work that, uh, and, and the ideas that were presented by, by Glenn and by Volodya in, in, in their books. There is this forecaster which um, gives a forecast and this, uh, this forecast represents, represents a commitment to bet, to bet on the outcome that is to follow. Yeah. So the outcome is, is a variable, it's something unknown. Are we going to bet on this uh, outcome? And each forecast represents a commitment to bet by a forecaster. And then there is a skeptic who can take up the uh, forecaster on these successive commitments. So um, in each commission, commitment in, in this sequence. And the idea is that he can try to exploit them in order to become extremely rich. And then randomness and calibration means, so the sequence and the, and the outcome sequence and the forecast sequence will be calibrated, will be well calibrated when there is no successful strategy for skeptic to become extremely rich. That is the basic idea that we're going to, uh, to flesh out. And so what, what I'm trying to go what I'm going to try to do today is I'm going to start from this intuitive basic idea, work myself to a definition. Yeah? So do the mathematical preliminaries in order to be able to give you a definition that's that of randomness that follows from this intuitive idea. And then in the second part of the talk, use that definition to derive a number of properties and explain those properties to you and explain what these properties tell us about this notion of imprecise randomness that we uh, get to in this way. So let me start by trying to go from intuition to definition, and I'll start with the precise case. So the next topic is precise forecasting and the Martingale approach. Let's look at general precise forecasting. So I have an outcome sequence, the black sequence in this slide here, and before each, um, <coughs> For each outcome, there is this precise forecast, which is a number in the unit interval, which gives the probability of, uh, of the one on the next, uh, for the next outcome each time. So to explain how this works, let's first concentrate on a single precise forecast and see what this means. So we have this forecaster who specifies the forecast for an outcome X, and I write a capital letter X because it's still unknown at that point. Yeah, so capital letters will mean unknown things. And it's an outcome in the unit interval. Now we will interpret this forecast, this precise number, as a commitment to adopt this uh, P, this forecast, as a fair price for X. In other words, when we have this commitment by forecaster, it means that, that we have a skeptic who can take forecaster up from these commitments. Now, specifically, what this means is it is a fair price. Therefore, it is also an, um, a supremum buying price. So this means that for any lower price than this supremum buying price and any, well, uh, any stakes alpha, no negative stakes alpha, what will happen is that uh, forecaster will have to accept to buy this gamble X, this unknown variable X, for a price Q. So X minus Q, X minus Q must be acceptable to him, multiplied by any non-negative stakes. So this is what he, um, what what forecaster will accept for himself. So he will accept to also give away the uh, the um, uh, additive inverse of that uh, of that gamble. He will accept to give this away to skeptic. And then it's also, uh, at the, since it's a fair price, it's also at the same time an infimum selling price, which means that for any larger uh, price R than P, and any um, any beta that is non-negative, skeptic will accept to sell X, so give away X, which accounts for the minus here, give away X and get, get R in return, and this multiplied by any non-negative uh, stakes beta. And this is what he accepts, so he will be uh, willing to give away 
the, uh, the additive inverse of that to skeptic. And any combination, any sum of these things will also be um, uh, deemed acceptable to, um, to forecaster. Yeah? So this means that, and then at the end, of course, reality, there's a reality, another player, and he will determine or she will determine the value of, uh, of this, uh, the next outcome. And therefore, then the next outcome will lead to a specific value of the um, of the gamble that is a payoff that will be paid to to skeptic. If it's negative, then skeptic will decrease his capital. If it's positive, skept skeptic will be able to use these these uh, these commitments by forecaster to increase his uh, current capital. So that is the idea. So um, what? Well, what we then know is that the gambles that are available to skeptic are, are any sum of these two things here. So look like what is in, in gold on, on the top equation here. But alpha and beta are any real numbers. Q is any number smaller than the uh, forecast P and N is any number larger than the forecast P. Now these gambles, you know that X can take the value zero or one which means that there are actually two numbers here, f of zero and f of one, and we can represent these two numbers in a two-dimensional plane, right? As the point in a two-dimensional plane. And so the region, if I, if I look at all these gambles, all these points in the two-dimensional plane that are given by this equation for these conditions on alpha, beta, q, and r, then all these gambles make up the blue region here. And we can characterize that blue region when we introduce the expectation functional that is associated with the probability P of one, this is this expectation functional. And so the blue region is exactly the points, the gambles for which this expectation associated with the forecast P uh, is negative, is non-positive, right? So that is the blue region. And so all these points represent gambles that are available to skeptic as a result of forecasters commitments by specifying a forecast P. So that is what happens for one forecast. Now, what happens if we have many successive forecasts? Well, then it's useful to represent all that could happen. Um, so all the possible outcomes of this, uh, of this uh, having zeros and ones, successive zeros and ones in an event tree, you know, where we can represent everything that can happen, all the uh, strings, if you want, all these successive um, outcomes or possible successive outcomes then occur as finite com finite sequences of zeros and ones, and these can represented, be represented in a following event tree, right? Um, so the, uh, the nodes in this tree are possible sequences, finite sequences of zeros and ones, and they will be called situations. So situation is just a node in the tree or just a finite sequence of zeros and ones. And I'll denote the set of all the set situations by this, um, this uh, blackboard bold S. Then we also have, of course, infinite sequences of zeros and ones. And so these are the paths in this infinite tree. This tree goes on and on and on. Um, and, um, and any path in this is an, an infinite sequence of zeros and ones. And so I'll denote paths by omega and capital omega will denote the set of all paths. It's just a bit of notation that I will need in uh, what we will do later on. So these are event trees. Now, what forecaster does is in such an event tree, attach a, a, a forecast to each possible situation. So in each possible situation, he will emit a certain forecast, a precise number between zero and one. Now that means that we can define a forecasting system. This forecasting system is just a function that associates with each situation in the tree, with each of these situations, a specific precise forecast. And we'll call I'll denote such a forecasting system by phi. So phi is just a function on the situations that uh, gives us in each situation a specific forecast. Um, yeah, so as I said, if there's any problem or any anything that you don't understand, please interrupt me. I'm not looking at the at the chat, so you might want to just uh, interrupt me uh, with using the voice. Uh, does Phi take account of what forecast was made during the path? Oh, that, that, is, that is possible, that is possible. In, in this case, 
we're just um, we're just imagining, in a sense, um, that um, that this is made up in advance. Um, I'll talk later about uh, the, the the case where uh, we don't have to specify where you don't have to specify a forecasting a system in all the possible situations. But at this point, um, I'm just imagining that this forecast is specified in in advance. Yeah. Thank so, you. Okay. So in, in, in classical probability, this, this amounts to specifying a conditional probability in finite sequences of, of events, right? So um, that is what, what is being done there. Okay, so now this is a forecasting uh, system. Gert, uh, um, Gert couldn't, yeah. we, couldn't we answer Paul's question by saying that this forecasting system does take into account uh, <clears throat> everything that's been seen in the game. Um, I was asking if it takes account what has been predicted. Well, um, a you could. strategy can take account. It's like a spending strategy. It's a strategy. And a strategy takes account of what you have done yourself. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. That can go into the definition. So. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, you could do that. Um, so, well, just to go on, then uh, let's see what, what, what skeptic can now do. So forecaster has specified a forecast in each possible situation. And now you can ask yourself, okay, in each of these situations, there is a forecast and therefore there is, there is uh, an, uh, the availability of a number of gambles for two skeptic in those situations to bet on the subsequent outcome. So for instance, in this situation, um, here we have a semi-plane of available gambles with non-negative expectation, right? And so those are the gambles that are available to skeptic in this situation in order to bet. In another situation, there is another forecast which corresponds to another set of available gambles. And this situation zero, zero here, we have another forecast which allows skeptic to use other gambles to, uh, to take up uh, uh, the forecaster to take forecaster up on his uh, on his commitments. So this is what 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 actually happens in such a probability tree because we have a probability tree now in each uh, of the uh, situations there now is a probability for what is going to happen next. And this leads to a set of available gambles in each of the possible situations. Okay. And this now allows um, us to introduce what we call capital processes. The idea being that skeptic can now, in each of these situations, select a gamble. And if he selects a gamble that is available in each situation, uh, that amounts to a, a kind of a, a strategy, right? He can, by selecting a gamble in each situation, make up a strategy for increasing his capital. How does that work? If we are in a certain situation, we have a certain capital there, then he selects a gamble that is available. So I've drawn the set of available gambles here. There is a point here which represents that gamble. It has, uh, when, when the outcome is one, it gives a reward Fs of one. And if the gamble outcome is zero, it gives a reward Fs of zero. So in those two cases, in the two children in the tree, in the ch child S1, I increase the available or the current capital M of S by the value of the gamble in one, which leads to a new capital and similarly in the situation S0. So by selecting a gamble, an available gamble uh, in each of these situations and an available gamble as re remember is a gamble for which the expectation, the local expectation, so the expectation that is associated with a local forecast in situation uh, S, that expectation must be non-negative. And of course, this leads to the definition of a, sorry, of a super martingale. The super martingale is a process, so a function from situations to real numbers, um, where the incre increments, so the value of the gamble in the children minus the value of the gamble in the situation itself, where these increments have a non-positive expectation in all the situations. So this is what we call the super martingale condition in the tree. And of course, what these super martingales or these capital processes are, they're just skeptic, uh, uh, skeptics way of trying to become rich by exploiting the, um, the commitments that, uh, that the forecaster makes. That is what these uh, capital processes or super martingales are. So 
every way of selecting an available gambo in each of the situations leads to a super martingale and vice versa. Okay, then what we can do next is we can try and use, and this is interesting because from a measure theoretic point of view, what we get is we can use these super martingales to get to a measure on the uh, probability measure on the set of all possible paths. And I've already said that a possible path, a path is a, an infinite sequence of zeros and zero and ones, and we can identify these um, with the, uh, the real numbers between zero and one. So if we have any bounded measurable function there, then we can express the expectation of that function, uh, um, which is this linear functional, as uh, using the super martingales, using this condition. And this is actually a, a theorem that was proved by Jean Vu in 19, 1939. So for instance, if I have uh, forecasts one half in each of the situations, so a fair coin, forecast, then this expectation will be the expectation associated with the uh, Lebega measure on that, um, on that um, interval. Okay, so this is the, the precise case. Now it's quite obvious what we can do, or it's quite, it's quite intuitive now, what we can do to turn this or to make this uh, imprecise. So what we're now going to do is I'm going to repeat this argument, but now uh, try to, to uh, go for imprecision and to replace everything that was precise in um, or the forecasts that were precise in the previous account by intervals. So I have this sequence of zeros and ones and I'm going to replace the precise forecasts P1, P2, P3 and so on by interval forecasts. So sub closed sub intervals of the uh, unit interval I1, I2 and so on. The question is now, what does this mean? Well, again, let's look at a single forecast. Um, we have a forecaster who specifies an interval forecast, and I'm going to denote the lower bound of that interval forecast by P lower and the upper bound by P upper. Yeah. So this is again interpreted as a commitment by a forecaster, a commitment to adopt the lower bound as a supreme buying price for X and the upper bound as an infimum selling price. These no longer necessarily coincide, so we no longer necessarily have a fair price, but we still have a supreme buying price and an infimum selling price in this interval case. And so what happens is, again, very much the same thing for any Q that is lower than the than the supreme buying price, this Q will be an acceptable buying price for forecaster. And so he must accept to get X and give away Q, multiply this by alpha, and then give this away to give the minus of this away to skeptic. Yeah. And similarly, for any price higher than the, than the infimum selling price, and for any non-negative stakes, he must be give, give, willing to give this gamble away to skeptic. It's a, com a complete repetition of what we said in the precise case. The only difference being now that the gambles that are available still have this form, but the condition and the conditions on alpha and beta are still the same, but the conditions on the Q and the R are now different in the sense that the Q must be smaller than the lower bound of the interval and the R, the selling prices must be larger than the upper bound of the interval, right? Because the lower bound and the upper bound don't coincide, we have fewer gambles that are available to skeptic in this case. So I've drawn a picture of the gambles that are now available to skeptic as a result of the commitments by forecaster, and we still have the blue region here as the set of all points in this uh, in this binary, uh, in this uh, two-dimensional space, all these gambles, in other words, that are available to skeptic. They are now a convex cone. They're no longer a semi-plane, um, and um, <coughs> they are completely characterized by a new functional. So in the precise case, we had the expectation uh, must be non-negative. And in this case, what we get is that the upper expectation must be non-negative, where the upper expectation is just the low, the upper envelope of all the expectations um, that, so E sub P that correspond to P in the interval I. So this is a way to construct this upper expectation operator and the available gambles are still characterized, characterized by a condition that says that the upper expectation must be non-negative for a gamble to be available. So we now have no longer have semi-planes of uh, available gambles, but only convex cones 
um, that include the third, the third orthant as a special case. Okay, so this is what happens now. We can again now go to an event tree, and in now what will happen is that that forecaster will, in each of the possible situations in that tree, emit or or specify an interval forecast. And now we get a forecasting system that with each situation associates an interval forecast, so a sub-interval of, um, of the unit interval. Right? So now this is a forecasting system. And again, uh, this leads to gambles being available to skeptic in each situation. So gambles that he can use in each situation in order to increase um, or to try and increase his capital. But these, if, if these sets of gambles are now convex cones and no longer semi-planes, but there is no real difference in, in approach, of course. Uh, we can go on, we can define a capital process, we take an available gamble, and we use that gamble to locally increase the capital in very much the same way as we did it in the, in the precise case. Yeah. So this leads again to the definition of a super martingale for a forecasting system, where the definition now is that the process increments must have a non-negative upper sorry, a non-positive upper expectation. Again, so the available gambles are the ones that are in these convex cones. So again, super martingales or capital processes are just possible ways for a skeptic to, uh, to increase, to become richer by exploiting the commitments that um, were made by forecaster when he specified his interval forecasts. So that is what we still have in this case as well. Okay, so where in the precise case we had Jean Gould's theorem, what is done now is we can use the super martingales to define a functional on the, uh, on the bounded functions of the possible paths. And that functional is, uh, well, this is the, the, the type of functional that was introduced by, by Glenn and Volodya in, in the two versions of, um, of their book. Um, these type of functionals are upper expectation operators and um, or upper prices. And you can use these upper expectation operators, um, which are defined using the, the super martingales. You can use these operators to define also upper and lower probabilities, right? So if I have an event, an event is now a subset of the set of all paths. So, so an event is a set of possible paths, a set of infinite sequences of zeros and ones. And we can associate with this set a special, a special function G that is one on the set and zero outside the set, so an indicator. And then the expectation, the upper expectation of that indicator becomes the upper probability of that event. And then we say that the property holds almost on almost all paths or almost everywhere. Um, if the upper probability of its complement is, is zero. So if the set A of those paths for which the property doesn't hold has upper probability zero. Yeah. So that is a notion of almost everywhere that you can associate with a forecasting system through the super martingales and the super martingales define an upper expectation operator and the upper expectation operator leads to an upper probability which leads to a notion of almost uh, almost everywhere. So that is something that I need to get out of the way also. Okay, so now we have the mathematical apparatus that will allow us to define randomness. The basic intuition, the basic idea behind the randomness of an outcome is, as I said in the beginning, there is no system for our skeptic to become infinitely or unboundedly rich by exploiting the gambles that are offered by forecaster when he specifies um, 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 his, um, his forecasts, his interval forecasts uh, on the successive outcomes in an outcome sequence. So we have an outcome sequence in each of these situations that are on the outcome sequence. Um, forecaster will have specified forecasts and skeptic can try and use to exploit these, uh, these forecasts in order to become richer along the sequence. 
And the idea then will be that the sequence will be, will be random if it is impossible, impossible for, for, for a skeptic to devise a system, a practical system for becoming infinitely rich by betting on the successive outcomes uh, of that sequence. That is the basic idea between, for, for, being, for being calculated. If this is impossible, if, if skeptic can, has no practical system for doing that, then the system will be random. It will mean that forecasts, forecaster gives good forecasts, that he, he emits good forecasts that are well calibrated in a sense. So we call a path random for a forecasting system. And this is now the definition, the generic definition of randomness. We call a path random for a given forecasting system. If there is no super martingale, remember a super martingale is a way for a forecaster, for a, for a skeptic to become rich by exploiting forecasters, um, forecasters uh, uh, commitments. So there is no super martingale that is non-negative. Non-negative means that skeptic is not borrowing any money. So he can't go in, in, into, into the negative reels. Uh, he can't have negative capital. Um, so it, there can be no non-negative super martingale that becomes unbounded on the path. And the, the, um, the blue, there are two conditions in blue here. That is, first of all, allowable, and the second is unbounded. Now, so allowable means, in, 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 in a generic way of speaking, means that there is no practical system that um, for, for, for skeptic to, to construct these uh, super martingales. I'll say later on, I'll give, I'll, give spe I'll give specific definitions of what it means to be allowable. So that is one thing that can vary in this definition, see the notion of allowable, what is allowable, what are allowable super martingales. Another thing that can change in this definition is the way that a path becomes unbounded. Yeah, that is another thing that can change. So this will lead to a number of definitions, different definitions for randomness. The first one that I'll introduce is, is Martin Leuf randomness because it is an immediate generalization of the notion of uh, randomness that was introduced by uh, Per Martin Leuf. So we will call a path Martin Leuf random when the notion of allowable is, uh, is um, instantiated, or the notion of allowable that is instantiated is lower semi-computability. So allowable, when allowable means lower semi-computable, meaning that there is a computer algorithm, that there is an algorithm that allows us to approximate the super martingale from below uh, um, in, in that, that is the notion of what semi lower semi-computable means. So we have an algorithm that can approximate the uh, super martingale in all situations from below. Um, that is, so that is one thing that we specify here. And then unbounded is just unbounded. So it can't, it can't become unbounded, which, which means, so unbounded means that, that there is no real number that remains above it. Uh, above that super martingale on the path. So when that is, when, when, when we get lower semi-computability for the notion of allowable, um, then we get martin Leif randomness. And this is a generalization of martin Leif randomness in uh, two, two interval forecasts. Computable randomness stands to reason when we change uh, or we change the notion of allowable into computable, meaning that we can approximate the super martingale using a computer program in any situation to any precision uniformly in all the, in, in all the, in all the situations. So when, when the uh, super martingales need to be computable, then we get a notion of computable random. And then of course, when we replace um, allowable by computable, and we replace unbounded by computably unbounded, which means that um, that the super martingale must increase at least as fast as a computable increasing function. Uh, then, um, then we get a notion of computably unbounded. Uh, this is a, st a stricter notion of unboundedness. And so in that case, we get a notion of what is called Schnorr randomness. And we extend the classical notion of Schnorr randomness to, to intervals. You, you can have many more definitions if you want, but these are the three notions that I'd like to talk about here. So we have three different 
versions of randomness, the Martin Leuf version, the computable version, and the um, Schnorr version of randomness. Those are the ones that I'm going to talk about in particular here. So three instances of a definition of randomness. Okay, so now we have the definitions of randomness. A very simple idea. Skeptic can't become unboundedly rich by exploiting um, the forecasts uh, given by forecaster on the path under consideration. Okay, now we're going to use these definitions to study a number of consistency results. The first one is quite a nice one, and it's it's related to uh, to uh, a result that Phil David proved in the precise case when he uh, his, his celebrated um, the well calibrated Bayesian theorem can be can be of course also be proved be proved in in this. Uh, imprecise case, you could call this the well calibrated imprecise Bayesian, if you'd like. So the idea is that forecaster, as soon as he specifies a forecasting system, he implicitly believes that he is well calibrated in the sense that with his forecasting system, we can associate um, an upper probability, we can associate an upper expectation functional through the through the martingales, as you will remember. This leads to a notion of almost everywhere or almost everything or almost all paths. Well, for a, well, you can prove that almost all paths are random in this sense in an imprecise probability tree. So in other words, the set of all random paths has lower probability one in this forecasting system and the set of non-random paths has uh, upper probability zero correspondingly in the system. So you can translate this by saying that any forecaster believes himself to be well calibrated. In a measure theoretic sense, this tells us that random paths are legion, that there are very, very many random paths because they have lower probability one. Yeah? So there's quite a, a number of them. All right. Now, as a consequence, of course, um, <clears throat> any forecasting system has at least one path that is random. And the notion of randomness doesn't really matter whether we take Martin Leuf or computable randomness or Schnorr randomness. It works for all three kinds of randomness. So as a corollary, because there's the, the, the set of all um, random paths has lower probability one, there must be at least one path that, has, um, that, that is random because the lower probability of the empty set is zero. So that's very trivial corollary. So, but this already tells us that every, path, every, every forecasting system has at least one random path. Now we will use that and we will need that later on. But there's much many more than one. Uh, typically there's an infinity and typically a countable infinity of random paths. A non-countable infinity, sorry. Uh, an uncountable infinity of random paths. So that is what typically happens. Okay. In order to discuss a number of other results, um, what we will need is a new notion, and that is the notion of a stationary forecasting system. So a stationary forecasting system is a forecasting system that gives the same interval forecast to any situation. So we have a constant interval forecast, the same one in each situation. This is, of course, a generalization um, of the case of, for instance, a fair coin forecast, where we have the same forecast, one half, precise forecast, one half in each of the situations. So here we have the same interval in each of the situations. We'll call this a stationary forecasting system. Now, um, in order to continue, I need to mention, briefly mention, church randomness. So in the case of uh, fair coin, um, a fair coin randomness, um, Church came up with, uh, Alonzo Church came up with a notion of randomness, which is consequently called, or has been called church randomness. If, um, if it's, so a path is called church random, if it satisfies the following condition. So let me unpack this condition for you. What you see here is, is a sum of, um, of possible outcomes along a certain path omega. So omega is a path, a sequence of zeros and ones, and omega at index k plus one is the k plus one 
uh, um, uh, situation on that path. So I, I go, I take the, the subsequent su situations on the path and uh, omega k plus one is the k plus first of those. Right, so what happens in this sum is I'm going to add all these, uh, all these outcomes, so all the ones in SEN and all the zeros on this path, but I'm going to select a number of them. So I have a selection process. A selection process is a, a function from the situations to zero and one. And if in a certain situation on the path, the selection is, is one there, that means that in this sum, this omega k, k plus one is going to multiply by one. So it's going to be uh, entered into selected in the sum. If the selection is zero, then it will disappear from the sum. So such a selection process is a way of selecting along a path certain, uh, certain outcomes and leaving out other ones, right? And I'm going to assume, or we're going to, to require that this uh, selection process should be recursive, which means that it can be computed by a computer algorithm in a way. So when is a path church random? If for any such way of selecting in a computable like way or in a recursive way, uh, uh, situations on that sequence, and then taking the, uh, the, the running average over all these selected sequences, then we get a, 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 a sequence of, of, uh, of running averages, and that sequence of running averages must go to one half, must have one half as a limit. If that happens on a path for any way of recursively selecting the sequence, the, the, the situations on the path, then uh, as happens here, then this uh, frequency of this relative frequency of ones along the selected situations must converge to one half. So in fact, classical church randomness means that we have the law of large numbers for all selected subsequences. That is church randomness. And what we know is that there are two types of randomness that we have looked at that imply church randomness. In other words, that imply that random sequences obey the law, the law, the law of large numbers. And that is Martin Leuf randomness and computable randomness both imply church randomness. But it's also known that Schnorr randomness does not imply church randomness. In other words, there are Schnorr random sequences that do not obey the uh, law of large numbers. And this has always been seen or has often been seen as a defect of church randomness, uh, of story of Snor Schnorr randomness. So this is the classical case of precise fair coin forecasts. What you can show then is that using our notion of Martin Leuf or computable randomness, but not of course Schnorr randomness because that would be contradict the classical result. But for Martin Leuf and computable randomness, we have a similar uh, notion of church randomness. So if we consider any path and any constant interval forecast that makes this path random, so any interval forecast that is that is that is that goes together well with this path. Then if you take it, an arbitrary recursive selection process and you look at the uh, running or the, the, yeah, the relative frequencies of the ones along these selected situations, then these will fluctuate, of course, along the path. And the limit inferior of all these, uh, <clears throat> of all these relative frequencies, uh, you can calculate that limit inferior and you can show that that limit inferior must always dominate the um, the lower bound of the interval forecast, and that the limit superior must always be dominated by the upper bound of the uh, compatible interval forecast. Right. So that is what we have. Of course, when you have a precise forecast, the minimum and the maximum will coincide, and then we will have that the limit is actually equal to that, um, to that common lower and upper bound. So then we recover uh, church randomness. So we, in, in general, we have a weaker notion of church randomness involving limit inferiors and limit superiors. Still, we don't have this, of course, as I said, for Schnorr randomness, but it turns out, and this I think is interesting, it turns out that you can recover something that is weaker 
uh, based on, on uh, Schnorr randomness alone. So let's now look at a case where we look a path, look at a path and a constant interval forecast that makes the path random. And random now means Martin Dirth or computably random or Schnorr random, doesn't really matter. But instead of a selection process, we now take a selection function. And the selection function is a function from the natural numbers to zero and one. And the idea is that if the selection function at any time k is one, then the outcome omega sub k is selected in the sum. So this, in other words, we have selection processes, but these processes no longer depend on the situations themselves, but only at the time, on the time at which they occur. And if you do that, then you can still prove that. So you get a weaker notion of, um, of church randomness if you want. And you can still prove that in that case, also Schnorr randomness implies that the limit inferior of these, um, of these relative frequencies will still dominate the lower bound of the forecast interval. And the limit superior will still be dominated by the upper bound of the forecast interval. And therefore, in the precise case, the minimum and the maximum will coincide. And so you see that the limit of these relative frequencies must then be equal to the forecast, constant forecast probability. So you recover a notion of church randomness, and it works for Martin Leith computable randomness and for Schnorr randomness. Okay, so that is another consistency result that we get. Now, I'm going to give you a number of examples, right? Um, so I've given you a definition, I've given you a number of, of consistency properties that a notion of imprecise randomness that we've introduced um, uh, satisfies, but um, still giving you, haven't given you any examples or still haven't shown that this notion is, this new notion is in any way useful. So let me try and convince you now in the coming slides that this notion is indeed useful. In order to do that, I will come back to what I said in the beginning, that it is sometimes useful to, uh, to look at randomness from two, in two ways. Right? So I, I said randomness and, and being well calibrated has two ways of looking at it. You can, uh, you can concentrate on the forecasting system and look at the random paths that uh, that, are, that go together well with that forecasting system, that are random for that forecasting system. But the other way of looking at it is you concentrate on a fixed path, you fix a path, and you look at all the forecasting systems that make that path random. And what I'm going to do is here, I'm going to concentrate on constant, on stationary uh, forecasts. So I'm looking at the stationary forecast, phi sub i. So this is the forecast that in each situation um, gives a forecast, a constant interval forecast i. Yeah. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect all closed intervals for which the corresponding stationary forecast, phi sub i, uh, makes the path random, the given path random. So I'm having a set, a set of intervals, a set of closed intervals, and for each of these closed intervals, the path that I'm looking at is random. And the dot that is here represents the type of randomness that I'm considering here. So the dot could stand for ML, for Martin Leuf random, or for C, for computable randomness, or for Schnorr randomness. So I'm getting three instances of these uh, collections of intervals. So each, uh, each I here is each I of omega, is a collection of closed intervals. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to study the structure of these sets of intervals, these sets of forecasts, if you want, these sets of constant stationary forecasts. So there's three properties that I'm going to prove. The first one is that these sets of forecasts are always non-empty. In other words, for each path, there always is at least one stationary forecast that makes it random. And it's a trivial one. There's at least a trivial one in there, and it is the one that is vacuous. In other words, the vacuous forecast, always the vacuous constant forecast, so giving the entire interval as, um, as a, 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 a forecast, always makes any sequence random. The reason is very simple. Look at the, on the left-hand side here. I've given you 
And in blue, what you get is, is the, uh, the region of available gambles that corresponds to a vacuous forecast, corresponds to the forecast zero one. So it's all the gambles um, that are nowhere positive. So the blue region here. So what skeptic can do when, when, when forecaster uh, has these, these uh, intervals is he can select any gamble from this, uh, from this set of available gambles. But their outcomes are always uh, negative or at best zero. Yeah? So the best thing that can happen for skeptic in order to increase his capital is that, the, that, the, uh, that he gets zero. Yeah? In all other cases, his capital will decrease. This means that super martingales in this specific case always decrease or at best remain constant. Now that means that a, a super martingale can never become unbounded. So all super martingales remain bounded by their initial value bounded above by their initial value and therefore never become unbounded, which means that any path will be random for this interval. So this is what we have here. The vacuous forecast is always, always makes any path random. So this means that this set is never empty. Okay. The second thing is an increasing this property. That is if I have an interval forecast that makes omega random and another interval forecast that is wider, yeah, that is more conservative, then that more conservative interval forecast will also make the path random. The idea behind this is explained in the, in the figure here on, on the left. I have two regions of available gambles for the two forecasts. The smaller forecast here, I, leads to a larger region of available gambles. Right? It is, it is uh, more precise and therefore is, its region of allowable gambles or available gambles is closer to a semi-plane. Yeah, the larger forecast J uh, leads to a smaller region of available gambles that is a subset of the uh, set of available gambles for the set I, for the forecast I. Now this means that for the forecast J, there are fewer available gambles. So skeptic has fewer gambles available to him in order to try and, um, and increase his capital. So it will be more difficult for, for, um, for, uh, for skeptic to, uh, to increase her capital. It will be more difficult. Yeah. So it will be easier for, for a set, for a, for a path to be, to be random in this, um, in this, in, in this uh, larger, this larger forecast J. And this is the reason why um, if, I, if, if I makes a path random, then any super interval, any superset also makes a path random. Yeah? So this collection of intervals is non-empty and it has the increasingness property. If set is in there, then any superset, uh, any super interval will also be in that set. And then there is a third property, also an important one, and that is the intersection property. It says that if I have any two interval forecasts um, that make a certain path random, then consistency will guarantee that this intersection is non-empty. The intersection of these two forecasts must be non-empty. And moreover, that this intersection will also make the, um, the path random. Now, we've only been able to prove this for, um, for two notions of randomness, for computable randomness and for Schnorr randomness. We've not been able to prove it for, um, for Martin Leuf randomness. And this, I think, is, is, is quite interesting. It works. It works in the precise case. In the precise case, you can do it, and then, and then there's no problem. There's, there's a problem in the imprecise case. It works for super martingales that have a lower semi-computable multiplier. So if you have a lower semi-computable multiplier, uh, and if you restrict yourself to super martingales that are of that type, so martingales that need not be, um, so, so you restrict yourself not to all the lower semi-computable martingales, but to the ones that have a lower semi-computable multiplier, then you can prove it. But we haven't been able to find a proof 
for the more general case where these um, the randomness is associated with lower semi-computable super martingales. So that is an interesting open problem at this point. Is this intersection property, does it also hold in the imprecise case for Martin Leuf randomness, or do we need to change the notion of Martin Leuf randomness in the imprecise case um, in, in, uh, and have an alternative uh, definition there, a, one, a less obvious extension of the case um, in, in for, for precise probabilities? It's not clear yet at this point uh, whether this will be necessary. Can you explain that sense of multiple meaning of multiplier a little bit? Yes, I can try that. Uh, so the, the idea is that that um, uh, if you have a super martingale, you can always write that process using using a multiplier in the sense that what what happens is you will you will start with your your value in a certain situation, and in order to get to the next situation, you will instead of adding capital to it in, in, in two of the children's situa child situations, what you will do is you will multiply your capital um, with, with, with a, a number uh, that depends on, on, on the child. So this is what we call a multiplier. The thing that you, in each, in each situation, you multiply the current capital with um, in order to get to, in order to, get to, the, to the next value in, in, in the children. Um, that is what we call a multiplier process. So this is just a multiplicative way of looking at um, at, at super martingales. And if you want that, if you um, specify or, or or define randomness as uh, okay, the multipliers must be lower semi-computable rather than the martingales themselves, because this is not equivalent. Uh, if you say that the multipliers must be lower semi-computable, then you can prove that this inter intersection property holds. But we haven't found, haven't been able to find a proof for the um, for the case where the multipliers need not be. So we, you can have um, uh, super martingales that are lower semi-computable without their multipliers being lower semi-computable. And, that and that's true in the precise case, Garrett? No, no, no. In precise case, you can get around that. In the precise um, case, because in, in, in precise case, you can you can you can you can use you can use martingales instead of super martingales in the precise case, and you can get around it um, in that case. In that case, the uh, multiplier and the additive are equivalent. Is that? Yeah, indeed. Yeah, ah. or you can prove you can prove that they are. But in the imprecise case, it it, it breaks down the equivalence. I think. Well, we haven't found, found the announcer yet. So that is why this is an open problem. Yeah, so we don't, Thank we don't you. know what is the, yeah, okay. So um, that, is, that is one thing, but, but if you look at these three properties, uh, you, you immediately recognize them as filter properties, right? So what, what you see is that these sets I for a certain omega are in fact filters of intervals or interval filters. They are non-empty, they are increasing, and they are closed under finite, finite intersections. So they are filters of intervals. So now let me continue. Um, <clears throat> this is a bit of structure that emerges uh, by looking at the problem in, in, in this way. So now let me give a number of very simple examples to begin with. Consider any precise forecast P. And consider a stationary forecasting system with this forecast P. So we have a constant precise forecast in the same precise forecast in each of the possible situations. Take any path that is random for this forecast. We already know that there is at least one. And this is the property that I mentioned in the beginning. Any forecasting system has at least one path that is random for that forecasting system. So there's at least one path that is random for this forecasting system. And then we can look at which imprecise, which interval forecasting systems, which interval stationary forecasting systems make this path random. Well, then you can prove that an imprecise interval makes this path, path random. It's very easy to do if and only if it belongs, if, if the precise forecast P belongs to that interval. So in this case, our filter of intervals is in fact a principal ultra filter that is that is based on uh, on the set P. In other words, all supersets of the element P are uh, belong to the set of uh, <clears throat> to this filter of uh, of intervals that make the path omega random. 
This is quite trivial. So this is the trivial case of precise, um, precise forecasting systems and precise randomness. Okay. Another very trivial case, but that is, I think, uh, helpful in order to see some light in what is going on here, or shed some light on what is going on here, is um, that if we have a path that is recursive, in other words, it's computable. We can find out at each time whether the corresponding, seek, uh, the corresponding outcome is a one or a zero by, by using a computer program. And so we have a recursive path. Of course, if we have a recursive path, we can find out what its values at any specific time are. And because we can do that, we can predict what is going to happen using our computer program. We can predict what is going to happen. So skeptic knows he can calculate what the path is going to be. So skeptic knows that and can use that in his strategy to always select the, the appropriate function that will give him a positive, a positive yield. Yeah, and therefore he can always make sure that he increases his capital as soon as there are positive functions available. So as soon as there are any positive functions or gambles that are that are somewhere positive available he can use those because he know what the he knows what the path is it's computable and therefore he can he can compute a strategy and so this means that um, he can always uh, increase his capital without bound and so no sequence will be random as soon as there are positive gambles available or, or gambles available that are positive somewhere so the only way to to get rid of this is by looking at forecasts that do not lead to gambles that are positive uh, in, 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 in any of the uh, uh, possibilities. So in other words, the forecast can only, that the only forecast that excludes this is a forecast that allows um, no positive gambles or gambles that can become positive. In other words, the only one that does this is the, uh, the um, vacuous forecast. If I go back to the previous slide here, sorry, if I go back to the previous slide here, this is the one, right, where no outcome is positive. So in this case, when I have this forecast, then, then, then skeptic can never select anything that is positive because all the outcomes are always at best zero. But this is the only case where that happens. And therefore, the only interval that makes such a rec recursive path uh, random is the vacuous interval. So in this case, we have a filter of intervals that is a trivial filter. It is a singleton. It only contains that, uh, that interval, uh, the vacuous interval. So that is when we have a recursive path. Okay, this was very trivial. Let's look at a few more interesting cases. Let's consider any two real numbers in the unit interval, P and Q, and let's assume that P is smaller than Q. And let's now define a non-stationary forecasting system. It's non-stationary because what we do is we alternate in our, um, in our forecast, we alternate between P and Q. So we have P, if the length of the situation um, that we are defining the forecast in is uh, odd, and if the length of the situation or the depth of the situation um, that we are looking at the forecast for is, um, is even, then we use Q. So it's alternating between P and Q at subsequent times, if you want. So this is a non-stationary forecasting system. We know that there is at least one path that is random for this forecasting system. So take any such path, and we're now going to look at all the constant, all the stationary forecasts that make this path random. So we're looking at the filter of all the stationary forecasts that make this path random. But now the forecasts are stationary as opposed to your original forecast, which is non-stationary. So we're replacing the non-stationary forecast by a stationary one. This is what we're trying to do. And then you see that this, any interval will make the path random if and only if it includes the interval pq. That is a fairly a proposition that is fairly easy to prove. So again, we have a filter 
It's a principal filter of, of intervals. It's all the supersets of the interval PQ. So PQ is in this case also a smallest interval that makes, um, makes the path random. It also makes the path random in this case. Yeah, so this is what you see. What, ha what is happening here is we start with a non-stationary forecasting system and we see that we're able to it somehow model the randomness using a stationary one, but we have to pay a price for that because the, the model that we're using, the, the, the stationary model that we're using now must become imprecise. Yeah? Anything, any interval that is smaller than this PQ will never make this path random. So the price we pay for uh, uh, an easier representation, a simpler model, is imprecision. This is what we see from this example. Okay. Another imprecise forecasting system. I've called it phi almost one half. So the forecast is almost one half in the sense that the forecast will oscillate around one half and will converge to one half for paths for sequences that are longer and longer, yeah, according to a uh, one over square root of n fashion. So this is this uh, this uh, forecasting system. It's a precise one, so we have a precise forecast in every situation, and we know that there is at least one path that makes um, that is random for this forecast. Okay. Take any such path. The type of randomness that we consider is again immaterial for any type of randomness. We will look at the stationary forecasts that make this path random. Well, the stationary path makes this path random if and only if its lower bound is strictly smaller than one half and its upper bound is strictly larger than one half. So now we have a filter of intervals that has no smallest element because the smallest element would be one half, but you can prove that one half does not make this path random. Yeah. So this is why I call the forecasting system almost one half. Yeah. So this is a type of non-stationary forecasting system that is, that is precise yeah, and that you can try and describe Using, using interval forecasts, and you see that you get an, an interval, uh, a filter of interval forecasts that they allow you to do it, but it has no smallest element. So what um, we're slowly it, beginning to, sorry, yes? Um, is it important that it's a square root of n plus no, 33? No. no, okay. No, well, yeah, the n plus 33 is is there to uh, to make sure that you, you um, you, you get the right, this is for the, for the, for the, cal, for just for, for the, for the, to, to make sure that everything works well. In essence, what you get is as soon as you're far enough, you get one over square root of n behavior, right? Now, the idea behind this, the fact that it, it's not random for one half, but it is random for something that is close to one half is, is actually, can actually be found in a, in a, in a paper by, again, by Volodya. Uh, by by Volodya Vovk, um, where he looks at um, at precise forecasting systems, sequences like this, um, and and where he uh, he looks at distances between such forecasts and shows that um, what what that the the distance between two forecasts must satisfy a certain a certain property. There must be a minimal distance between two forecasts in order for them to be able to be random or um, for the same sequence or for the same sequences to be random for them. So uh, the idea here is that we, we make sure by, by choosing this, uh, this forecast in this way that, um, that this, this forecast is, is not random for one half because the distance between the constant random one half and this forecast is too large. That is, that is the idea. And so you can have many other functions here. This is the simplest one, the square root behavior that, that we found. But there are many more complicated ones that, that could work there, there as well. And so that is Thank the you. idea that this, yeah? OK. So um, now we have, we have this. Uh, so this is, I think, is, is, is quite interesting that, um, that we have, we have uh, uh, sequences, so numbers 
that are random for, uh, for this, but not for one half, and that are random for all the intervals that strictly include one half on both sides. So again, what we see is that the complexity of non-stationarity can in some way be recovered, be made easier, we can, we can get rid of it, um, that we can get rid of the non-stationarity, but we must pay a price for that um, in the sense that we lose, we lose the precision. Okay, now this might lead you, this, this kind of argument and these examples might lead you to suspect that, um, that all this talk about imprecision is in fact not necessary, right? That, that this imprecision only occurs when you try to, um, to, to use stationary forecasting systems that must be imprecise because you, don't, you, you, you get away from non-stationary ones. In other words, you could imagine or, or, or begin to believe at this point that, that um, non-stationary precise forecasting systems are enough. That the only reason why we would use uh, imprecise forecasting systems is because we, we deal with stationarity, we don't want to deal with non-stationarity. Yeah. So this is something that you might be led to believe by these examples, but it's not true. And it's not true because we have a theorem um, that says the following, and I'm going to try and unpack the theorem for you a little bit. So take any stationary interval forecast. So this is a constant one. It has many random paths, but there is, we prove that there is at least one path that is random for this uh, stationary system. So it is random for the stationary interval forecast. And by random, you can take any Martin Leuf computable or Schnorr randomness, doesn't really matter. It's random for this stationary folk, uh, imprecise forecast. But it's never random for any non-stationary computable forecasting system that has a smaller imprecision. So it's random for the interval forecast, but for any computable forecasting system with a smaller imprecision, what does that mean? So this forecasting system phi has in each situation an upper bound, the maximum of phi, so phi is an interval, take the maximum, the upper bound, subtract from it the minimum, the lower bound, so you get the width of the interval in situation S. Take the supremum over all these widths of all the intervals. If the supremum is smaller than the width of the stationary forecast, then no computable forecasting system can make the path random. Yeah. So if we have, so there are paths that are random for an interval, but that are not random for any computable forecasting system with a lower width. So in particular, not random for any precise forecasting system. Yeah. So this is what says that, that there are paths that, that are random for an inter, for, for, a, for that are imprecisely random that can never be modeled, never be attained, and never be explained by a forecasting system that is more precise, and therefore that, that or that is precise. Period. Right? So this is this is why we say that that randomness, this thing that we've discovered, is in fact inherently imprecise. There are sequences that are random that cannot be explained away, or whose imp whose imprecise randomness cannot be explained away as a result of non-stationarity. Okay, final result, we're almost there. I'm now going to explain to you why we also say that random paths are rare. Remember that in the beginning of this talk or close to the beginning of this talk, I said that random paths are legion. There are very many random paths because their lower probability, the lower probability of the set of all paths is one. So there's an infinity of them, an uncountable infinity of them, typically. So that's why I say they are legion in a measure theoretic sense. Now, um, I'm going to argue that they are, in fact, from a topological point of view, they are few and far between. They are rare. And in order to explain that, I need a notion of lawfulness. So remember, we have a path. A path is an, an infinite sequence of zeros and ones. I'm going to use this, this, uh, this idea here, this, uh, this graph here, to explain the notion of lawfulness. A path will be called lawful if there is an algorithm that takes any 
any situation on the path. So I've, the path here is red. So this is the path, an infinite um, sequence of zeros and ones. I take any selection on that path and I look at the, the tree of all the extensions of that, uh, of that situation on the path. So this is the tree here of all the extensions of those situations. And of course the path, the actual path must go follow one of these, must go through uh, one of these extensions. Now lawfulness of a path means that in, in, any, in any situation on the path, there must be an algorithm or there must be an algorithm and the other way around, there must be an algorithm such that in any situation on the path that I select, this algorithm will emit will use, give as an output uh, a number of extensions of possible extensions of that situation. I've depicted them in green here. So these are three possible extensions of that um, situation. And this must be restrictive in the sense that yeah, these two are not, not included. And therefore my path, if, if a path goes through S, it can still go uh, through these situations here, and they are not in this restrictive set of extensions. So it must be a restriction. It must be a restrictive uh, ex a set of extensions. So the algorithm must emit such a restrictive set of extensions in such a way that at least one of these extensions is a situation that the path also goes through. That is lawfulness. Okay, and then interestingly, uh, Muchnik, and a number of his colleagues proved in 1998 that any set of paths that contains only lawful paths is meager. And by meager, I mean meager in the sense of bare. So meager in the sense that it is a countable union of sets that are nowhere dense. So a nowhere dense set is a set uh, for which the interior of the closure is, is, is empty. So it's a very, very sparse, topologically sparse set. And a meager set is then a countable union of such nowhere dense sets. So it's also quite sparse, quite, uh, quite uh, rarefied, if you want, in a topological sense. And so Muchnik proved that um, any set that only contains low, lawful paths is meager. So uh, there's only, um, so the lawful paths are meager in a sense also. So this is a, a result that was proved. Um, and we were able to use this result because we were able to prove that any path that is not lawful is very wild. If I look at the uh, running average, uh, so, or the, the, um, the frequency, the relative frequency of the ones along such a path that is not lawful, then you can prove that the limit inferior of that running average must be zero and the limit superior of that running frequency must be one. So in other words, a not, for a not lawful path, it must oscillate very wildly. That is uh, what happens when a path is not lawful. But of course, now we can use our church randomness result to immediately prove that um, if a path is not lawful, since we know that this limit inferior must dominate if, if we are on a path that is random with respect to a, st a stationary interval i, this limit inferior must dominate the lower bound. So the lower bound must be zero. And this limit superior must be dominated by the upper bound. So the upper bound must be one, yeah? So a path can only be not lawful in, um, and random at the same time if the interval, if the, the for a random, for an interval rather that, um, that is the vacuous interval. So this is why we have a theorem that says, if you have any forecast that is strictly included in the, in the uh, unit interval, so the minimum is greater than zero or the maximum is smaller than one, then the set of all paths that are random for it, be it Martin Leuf, computably random or Schnorr random, must be meager. Um, and therefore, <clears throat> random paths are in a topological sense, few and far between. In very much the same way, by the way, as in the precise case. So this, of course, also holds for precise randomness and for precise randomness, this was already known. And this, it, in, in the paper by Muchnik, they proved that this is indeed the case that also for precise randomness, the random paths are topologically meager. Okay. So what this tells us then is that um, 
imprecise random paths are interesting from the same point of view as the precise ones because they are equally rare. And the division, the real division does not lie between precise and imprecise randomness, but lies between vacuous and non-vacuous. Yeah? There is no real distinction, I think, from this point of view between precise random paths that are, that are precisely random or precise random or precisely random and random paths that are imprecisely random from this point of view. The real difference is between vacuous forecasts and non-vacuous forecasts. Okay, so that brings me to the final slide and the conclusions here. Um, <clears throat> well, let me just repeat what I think we've accomplished here. We have a notion of randomness that allows for interval forecasts. It uh, shows a lot of interesting properties that, that are not present, are not visible when you only look at precise forecasts. So a lot more becomes visible, a lot more mathematical structure becomes visible when we look at imprecise forecasts. That is one thing. Um, we see that, that they are these, these imprecise random paths are as interesting as the precise ones. They cannot be explained away as a result, as an oversimplification. They cannot be really explained away because, um, because uh, the model that we use is, is not complex enough because of the result that, um, that precision, imprecision matters. If we have a, something that, that is uh, a path that is, that is random for an imprecise, um, interval, or at least there are paths that are random for an imprecise interval that are not random for anything that is more precise. So there is, it can't be explained away, this imprecision. That's what I wanted to say. And then finally, they are interesting also from a topological point of view, these, uh, these paths. There's much more to do, of course. Um, randomness has different approaches. Besides the, um, the Martingale theoretic one, there's also the, uh, the uh, approach that was initiated by Martin Löw, where randomness is explained using, using tests, randomness tests, um, computable sequences of uh, effectively open sets, in a sense. And um, uh, we are very close to a proof that for the notions of randomness that I've discussed here, computable randomness, Schnorr randomness and Martin Leff randomness in the imprecise case, you can also give definitions of randomness using those randomness tests. We're very close to a proof. So, but that is work in progress. Um, other work in progress is something that I mentioned at, at the beginning. Huh? You can also have a frequential approach to, uh, to randomness um, where you don't specify an entire forecasting system but you only give forecasts as you go along. So after observing a number of outcomes, you give a forecast for the next outcome. You don't specify core forecasts in the entire tree, only along the path that is realizing itself as you go along. That is the frequential approach. Now, Volodya Vovk and Alexander Shen have given an account, account of Martin Löw randomness uh, in the precise case. For that, I think it will be possible to extend that to the uh, to to interval randomness that shouldn't be too hard at this point. Then of course the question is can we use this idea? Can we extend it to more than 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 just two outcomes? And can we use this idea to uh, to start looking at uh, a statistics that uses imprecise uh, intervals and imprecise probability models rather than precise uh, probability models? That is a, a third idea that could be explored from this point onwards. I'm going to conclude my, uh, my talk here, and I'm, I'd be very happy to, to answer any remaining questions that you might have.